All right, so we ended last period. We were looking at triglycerides. Um, again, the formal name of triglycerides are the triacyl glycerols. And they come from the fact that we have um, a glycerol molecule reacting with three different fatty acids to make this kind of complex compound. Now, triglycerides can exist in this form where all three of the fatty acid groups are the same. So in this case, all three are stearic acid. They can also exist in a mixed state as well, where we can have any combination of fatty acids on the same glycerol molecule, and it's still considered a triglyceride. It's just considered a mixed triglyceride instead of a neutral um, triglyceride. So in the example here, we have a triglyceride where we've got a stearic acid group, an oleic acid group, and a palmitic acid group, all on the same glycerol molecule. So it is possible to have different combinations. And a mixed triglyceride doesn't have to be three different triglycerides. You could have two of one kind and a third one that's different. What matters is that they have some lack of uniformity amongst those three fatty acids. Oh, really? Now, one of the primary places where our body uses triglycerides, this is where a lot of our energy storage comes in. So in, you know, in large mammals, especially those that live in more extreme environments, where we tend to see this is this is what happens when an animal goes into hibernation. They gorge out, they eat tons of food right before the hibernation period. Their body turns those energy molecules into triglycerides. And basically that is what sustains those animals through their hibernation period. Um, our bodies do similar kinds of things as well, but on a much smaller scale. Excess sugars, excess fats, those can be converted to triglycerides in your body and stored up for long-term storage or even shorter-term storage, depending upon what your caloric needs are at a given period of time. When it comes to fats and oils, we've already kind of talked about these. We've talked about them from kind of the standpoint of what their chemistries look like. Do they have saturated fatty acids or unsaturated fatty acids in them? The main difference between fats and oils is phase. When we talk about something that is a fat, we are usually referring to something that is in the solid phase at room temperature. Compare that to an oil, we're talking usually about something that is in the liquid phase at room temperature. Now, it just so happens that the source of these fats versus these oils have a lot to do with animal source versus plant source. Those that we find in from animal sources tend to be more solid based, tend to be fats instead. Oils, on the other hand, tend to come primarily from plant sources, although we can find certain kinds of oils in fish sources as well. When we talk about saturated fatty acids, 
Again, we talk about things that tend to have higher melting points, very similar to what we talked about with um, saturated um, um, fatty acids and uh, saturated fats. The ability of those molecules to stack on top of each other does play a really significant difference when we do a, uh, a comparison. So, you know, here we have, this is olive oil. Olive oil is not a saturated fatty acid, it is in fact an unsaturated fatty acid. And we know that because each of those fatty acid chains on the triglyceride there have a kink in the hose, have that one mark of unsaturation, that double bond. And as a result, we can't get these triglycerides to pack together nearly as well because they all have that kink in the mark. So saturated fats tend to form more solidified kinds of bases because again, we're getting a lot closer packing because we don't have any double bonds in there to throw off the shape of the molecule. And so the molecules are able to pack a lot more closely together. They're able to melt at higher temperatures because of that increased level of interaction, level of attraction. Unsaturated fats, the ones that we find in things like olive oil, we're going to see that double bonding rear its head in there somewhere. And that's going to affect the ability of those molecules to get as close together. And that's why they're going to tend to be more in the liquid phase rather than the solid phase. Just as a comparison, this is really kind of cool. Um, this graph gives us an idea of if we're looking at solid materials versus liquid materials, things that we tend to think of as fats versus not fats, fats versus oils, we can see that there's usually a pretty big disparity in them between how much of their fats are saturated, which is represented by this deep blue line, versus how many of those fats are unsaturated, represented by these yellow and orange lines. The reason why beef tallow, butter, and coconut, beef tallow, by the way, this is why you can never get anything vegetarian at Buffalo Wild Wings, because if it goes into the fryers, it goes into beef. So pretty much every product they have is going to touch animal product at some point in the line down the way. But beef tallow, beef fat, you can see we've got a really good percentage of saturated fat. We also have a very similar percentage of monounsaturated. Monounsaturated fats, as you might expect, have greater attractions than polyunsaturated fats because they only have the one double bond as opposed to multiple double bonds. But if I get into the oils here, you can see a lot of oils have monounsaturated fats, especially the ones that we tend to use the most often, your olive oil, your canola oil, high in unsaturated fat, um, uh, monounsaturated in particular, pretty low in saturated fat overall. When we get into some of our more, our less common oils, some of our uh, more sophisticated oils that might be used for very specific purposes if you're using them for cooking. Soybean, sunflower, safflower, corn. We tend to see a lot more polyunsaturated compared to um, monounsaturated fats there. But very clear disparity here. In these ones that are solid phase, you're looking at almost 50% saturated fats in, in, in every one of their cases. With these liquid ones, we are looking at less than 10% saturated fats in almost all of the cases. And if it's not less than 10%, it's certainly less than 20% saturated. Now from a health standpoint, 
You're going to look at these oils and say that they're generally more healthy for you because they lack those saturated fats. Um, but, you know, there's obviously more to any one of those arguments as well. It's not just about saturated versus unsaturated. You got to look at things like trans fats and, you know, um, you know, especially for heart health. Um, polyunsaturated fats can be the ones that uh, get put under uh, greater notice uh, because they tend to be considered more heart healthy. All right, so that kind of wraps up what we were supposed to get through at the end of Tuesday. Let's get into kind of the back half of this chapter. Now understand on the back half of this chapter, we're not gonna touch section seven at all. If you looked at the reading assignment for tonight, you'll notice that it's just sections four, five, and six. Section seven's not in there at all. Don't expect it to be, you're not gonna see anything out of there. What we wanna look at here are some chemical properties of these triglycerides though. And what we're gonna focus on is the fact that there is a relationship between some of those fatty acids, especially the polyunsaturated ones, and what we would consider to be, in some ways, more heart healthy um, fats. So, for example, we know that really the only difference between a saturated triglyceride and an unsaturated triglyceride is the fact that the saturated ones don't have any double bonds there. Well, what if I introduce hydrogen into the process? We've seen hydrogenation reactions in a number of different other places. The hydrogen attaches itself across the double bond, turns that double bond into a single bond. Well, if I do that with what we would consider oils, that would turn them into salts because you would turn those saturated fats into, or excuse me, those unsaturated fats in the oils to saturated fats. Now, why don't we go all the way to talking about them as, you know, butters or pure fats? Well, because the processes used are not completely hydrogenated. We call this partially hydrogenation. Some of the oil molecules get hydrogenated, turned into saturated. Some of them do not. And what results is you usually end up getting a product that is softer. Now, in the world of butters and spreads, softer is a good thing, right? You ever try to spread butter straight out of the refrigerator? It's a lot of fun, especially if you're trying to get it on your toast. I mean, it's very easy to spread all over that piece of bread and not break the bread at all. Whereas if you do the same thing with a margarine, the margarine, because of that softer nature of it, it spreads pretty easily. And that's one of the reasons why some of these products exist. They give you some of the same characteristics of a butter, but without some of the frustrations. That's what partial hydrogenation is all about. Go to full hydrogenation, then you're getting back into kind of that, that zone where you've got that fat that's very solid and unbelievable. So the first kind of reaction we're going to talk about are those hydrogenation reactions. In those hydrogenation reactions, we convert an unsaturated fatty acid into a saturated fatty acid. Now, how that works realistically is we usually take hydrogen gas and bubble it into the oil in the presence of some kind of a catalyst. 
nickel is usually the most prominent one because it doesn't corrode. You don't end up with nickel inside of your um, margarine or whatever, which is a good thing, generally speaking. So that's the process. Hydrogenation. Again, that double bond gets turned into a single bond in the process. Now, if we were talking about partial hydrogenation, what we would be seeing is either um, a percentage of these molecules being converted to the saturated, which is probably the more likely scenario, as opposed to um, individual bonds being. So instead of, you know, one of those gets hydrogenated and the other two don't, it's more like one molecule gets hydrogenated and two don't, or whatever the ratio is. And so, as I was saying, when this is done commercially, the way that we stop the process from becoming completely hydrogenated is we stop the flow of hydrogen. We stop the process before there's enough hydrogen added to completely convert every one of those double bonds into single bonds. And the net result is that we get something that was in the liquid phase converted into something that is kind of in a in-between state. That's what we mean by soft and semi-solid. It's definitely not a liquid. You know, if you hold a fresh tube of margarine or shortening upside down, it's not going to flow out liquid wood. But at the same time, it's really not super solid and hard either. It's very, very soft. The melting point that we get largely depends upon what degree of hydrogenation was introduced. The more saturated we make that fat, the harder, the more solid it's going to be. And so that, along with kind of the characteristics, what triglycerides are used, that's what can give us these different forms and uh, hardnesses for these different products. You know, obviously, stick margarine is going to be a little bit harder, a little bit more rigid than pub margarine or shortening would be. And that's intentional, right? So why? Well, it goes back to the chemistry. In the chemical process for when we were making it, we introduced more hydrogen into the reaction vessel and that allowed it to be more solid, allowed it to be more rigid in its overall property. Now, Given everything that we've been talking about, we've, we've, we've gotten into a lot of health effects, a lot of health benefits. It would be inappropriate at this time to talk about margarines and not talk about the idea of trans fats. Because that's one of the big detractors on the side of margarines in particular is because some of that partial hydrogenation is going to leave behind things that are double bond. And if those double bonds are in trans positions versus cis positions, they do have different effects on your health. So when it comes to fatty acids, we already talked about the idea that these unsaturated fatty acids can either be cis conformed or trans conformed. We talked about the differences that cis and trans had on melting point. Cis ones generally tend to have lower melting points, be more liquid-like than the ones with that were trans, because that trans double bond 
kind of fits with the overall ability of those other molecules to collapse on, to stack on. Trans fats, which can occur naturally, but can also occur through artificial processes in these unsaturated fats. Where we tend to see them naturally, these would be in products like milk, eggs, beef. You know, generally speaking, things that your doctor tells you need to limit your intake on, especially as you grow older in age. Aside from those, those are natural sources. Where we can see trans fats showing up kind of in a hidden agenda way is in these partially hydrogenated food products. So when we take these oils, which generally speaking, do not have large numbers of trans fatty acids in them. We introduce the hydrogenation process. Hydrogenation process changes the molecules. And where we see trans fats showing up, these would be in some of the oils that end up uh, being used in deep fryers. We find them in some places uh, where uh, bakery goods might come in, especially um, certain kinds of shortening will use. Um, and so that shows up in your bread, your baked goods, your cookies, um, your crackers and your chips, uh, especially again, if, if frying is involved in it. Shortening, stick margarine, um, tub margarine. So when trans fats were kind of identified as being these potential issues, what you started to see was, first of all, trans fats start showing up on food labels. And the second thing is a lot of these companies ended up going back to the chemistry, back to the processing and trying to figure out how to do it better to try to limit trans fats as much as possible. All right, let's review the last couple of minutes here. Which of these statements are true and which are not? So let's take a minute, go ahead and answer these for yourselves, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back. All right, let's see how we're doing here. First question. Do vegetable oils have more unsaturated fats? Absolutely. Do vegetable oils have higher melting points? No, no. Remember, fats are solids, oils are not.
does hydrogenation convert some double bonds in, from cis to trans? All right. I didn't state this explicitly, but yes, that is one of the concerns. Um, and the reason why is, as we've talked about, that cis conformation does seem to be a little bit harder to manage, right? Can't get the molecules nearly as close together. So what happens is as the hydrogenation process is taking place, some of those cis bonds will convert to trans because the trans is going to be a little bit more stable. So in the process of changing the chemical structure of this fatty acid, some of those cis do turn into trans. And the main idea of trans, again, looking at cis versus trans, those trans bonds are going to look a lot more like saturated fats than unsaturated fats. And that's one of the main concerns with trans fatty acids is that because they kind of look similar to saturated fats, there is some concern that they act more like saturated fats in your body. So this third statement is true. What about the fourth statement? Do animal fats have more saturated fats? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's the first kind of reaction that these substances can take, the hydrogenation reaction. For the second kind, we're going to look at hydrolysis. Now, again, hydrolysis is something we've already seen. Hydrolysis reactions are when water gets inserted into the compound. And basically what is happening here is basically the reversal of what we saw in the esterification reaction that formed these triglycerides in the first place. So remember, if we go back, to the formation of triglycerides from their components. We had glycerol and we had the fatty acids. We introduce them to each other. They react with each other. We end up getting water as one of the byproducts along with our triglyceride. A hydrolysis reaction basically reverses this takes these waters, reintroduces them to the triglyceride with the help of some heat and some catalyst. So in particular, we're looking at acids here. We need acid present to do this. And what we see is we're gonna split it back up again. Hydrogen on one side, hydroxide on the other. We end up getting glycerol back again. We end up getting our fatty acids back again. So this is the reversal of the process that formed these triglycerides in the first place. Now, this reaction can take place in the presence of a strong acid. This can also take place in the presence of a digestive enzyme. Um, digestive enzymes in this particular case are the lipases. Lipases, as you might expect, lipase, lipid. <clears throat> We're talking about enzymes that break down fats. That's their particular job. And so in your body, these are the kinds of reactions that generally take place during the digestion process using either the acid in your stomach or the digestive enzymes that exist throughout your body, uh, especially in your uh, digestive tract. 
uh, not necessarily just limited to the stomach. Um, these are the kinds of reactions that take place that allow us to break down fats into smaller molecules that can then be used by the rest of the body. So that's reaction type number two. Reaction type number three is something called saponification. Saponification reactions are the reactions that are used to make soap. So if you go back to the days, we're talking depression era, my grandparents and their parents' generation. For you, you might have to go back another generation still for that. Some of you. Um, this was how this was how soap was made. This is how soap was made. You took animal fat, you melted it down, you got it to a really high temperature to where it was nearly boiling, and then you threw some lye in it. And the purpose of the lye was to start to create these saponification reactions. Now, that's not what they, that's, they didn't know that that's what was going on necessarily. They just knew that the process to bake soap was you did this. And so the NaOH, that is, that's lye. And heating up the fat to a boiling, there's your heat. The combination of those two would give us a couple of things. First of all, it would take the triglycerides that were there, the OHs would go and turn those triglycerides back into glycerol. So there's our um, trialcohol showing up again. And what we would get is the formation of a salt. The salt being the, the kind of bringing together of sodium ions from the lye and the remaining fatty acid minus that extra hydrogen. And that salt is what we know as soap. Now, different kinds of bases will give us slightly different reactions. So when we use sodium hydroxide, the resulting salt is um, usually pretty hard. It's solid. This is what uh, becomes the basis of, you know, like bar soaps. If we change the lye into potassium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide has another common name. You might have heard of it. It's called potash. If we change the lye into potash, the resulting salt isn't as solid. It's more of kind of like a suspension liquid. And that becomes the basis of a liquid soap. So when you go to the store, and you pick out solid soaps and liquid soaps, the ones that are truly soaps, we can usually tell their process based upon what form they are. Are they solid or are they liquid? The process again shows up here. So what happens is we are breaking this bond here. The H from the hydroxide attaches to the glycerol to make the tri-alcohol glycerol. And the O snaps itself onto this to make our fatty acid. Now, it's not a true fatty acid because, again, there's no hydrogen here. So this isn't a true acid. Again, for an acid, we need the carbonyl and the OH. We don't have the carbonyl and the OH. We have the carbonyl and an O. That H being missing 
means that we've got an extra electron on that oxygen. And that's what gives it a negative charge. Since it has a negative charge, it can pair with sodium's positive charge and make an ionic compound. Ionic compounds, if you remember back to chapter six, we call those salts. And so that's why we can refer to soap as a fatty acid salt, because it's basically an ionic compound just with an organic twist on that negatively charged ion. So again, just kind of summarizing here, everything we've talked about as far as reactions of lipids, we've seen before somewhere else. The reaction to form the lipids in the first place, well, that's just an esterification reaction. We saw that last chapter. Alcohol plus acid gives us ester. The only difference is that we are a little bit more intentional with what our acids are and what our alcohol is. Our alcohol is glycerol. Our acid is a fatty acid, a really long chain carbon. Hydrogenation reactions. We saw those before as well. You take something with a double bond, you introduce hydrogen to it in the presence of a metal catalyst. It turns into a single bond. Same idea here. We're just looking at the fatty version of it instead. Hydrolysis reactions. Esters with water in the presence of acid will break apart into alcohols and acids. Well, same thing. The only difference is what those acids and alcohols are. The acids in this case are fatty acids. The alcohols in this case is glycerol. <clears throat> the only truly different one that we haven't discussed is the idea of saponification. Saponification is a general class that can apply to all esters, but we generally think of it mostly with fats. Because again, the soap making process, which has very deep ties to kind of our early forebears in this country, um, and not just in this country, all over the world. But this is a very well-known process, especially amongst, um, I won't say primitive, because that's not the right word, but earlier, less technologically advanced um, civilizations. All right, moving on into section five. Section five, we're talking about phospholipids. Now, if you've taken a biology course before, you have heard of phospholipids. Phospholipids are the um, compounds that make up cell membranes. What we're gonna do in this kind of overview is we're gonna look at phospholipids just kind of generally and try to pick out some key common characteristics among them. So first of all, with phospholipids, there are two subclasses of phospholipids. The reason they are called phospholipids is because they are Lipid groups, fatty acid groups that happen to contain a phosphate ion in them. So PO4, that is our phosphate group. And that's what gives phospholipids their phospho kind of name. In them, there are two different categories. There are the glycerophospholipids, which look very similar to triglycerides. Only difference between a phospholipid and, or excuse me, a glycerophospholipid 
and a triglyceride is the fact that one of those fatty acids groups has this phosphate subgroup on it. The other kind are the sphingomyelins. And the sphingomyelins, we can usually pick out pretty easily. Because unlike the glycerol groups that have three groups hanging off of them, sphingomyelins only have two. They have a fatty acid group, and then they have the phosphate group. Now, in both cases, that phosphate group, that PO4, is kind of acting as a bridge between the glycerol or the sphingosine and an amino alcohol group. And amino alcohols, just kind of um, foreshadowing here, amino alcohols are exactly what they sound like. We've already talked about the idea of amines and alcohols. What an amino alcohol is, is it is an organic compound that has an amine on one side and an alcohol on the other. That's why it's called an amino alcohol. So it's got a nitrogen group on one side and an OH group on the other. And the OH group is gonna be the part that attaches to the phosphate. So let's kind of go about this from kind of the more familiar standpoint. A glycerophospholipid looks almost identical to a triglyceride. You've got the glycerol backbone. So you've got that three carbon alcohol. That's the backbone that's holding this together. Two of the groups are fatty acids. They can be fatty acids of a number of different varieties. They form up just the same way, using esterification reactions, dropping water molecules as they react. The third group is a group where we get an ester bond. So a link between the oxygen of the glycerol and this phosphorus group. And then the phosphorus group attaches to the alcohol part of the amino alcohol. As far as the amino alcohols are concerned, there are three. There are three different amino alcohols that can create these glycerophospholipids. The three are choline, irine, and ethanolamine. And really the, the, okay, that's a mistake. Let's fix that real quick. I even read it like a dope. Let's try that again. They are choline, serine, and ethanolamine. Now, how do you tell them apart from each other? It's mainly just a recognition thing. Um, choline has um, what we would call a quaternary amine on it. You've got that nitrogen with four other carbon groups around it. That's what a quaternary amine would be. Um, when we talked about amines, we didn't talk about quaternary amines because when they exist, they only exist when that nitrogen has a positive charge. So choline, we've got a quaternary um, uh, amine on that. Um, for serine, we basically have um, what looks like an acid and an alcohol uh, with a nitrogen in the middle. Ethanolamine is exactly what it sounds like. You've got an NH3 on one side, you've got the ethanol on the other. So basically you've got an ethanol attached to a nitrogen. At pHs of 7.4, thereabouts, 
these will become ionized. And they, these are the ionized forms that they take on. Why is 7.4 particularly important? That's your own pH. Your blood has a pH of roughly 7.4, give or take a little bit um, in either direction, give or take a lot in either direction, and you start to run into uh, blood disorders. Um, your blood, we'll talk about buffers um, in, a, in the next couple of weeks, but your blood is designed to be in a very, very, very tight pH window. So really close to 7.40. Take it a little bit above 7.38, 7.42, a little bit below, you're okay. Your blood pH starts to get into 7.1, 7.0. It's called acidosis. Generally not good for you. Yeah. um, um, And there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of body chemistry that goes into into that as well. But yes, um, um, that and, um, uh, you know, the, another place where you can get into that, uh, ketosis, um, if you know people who follow the keto diet, they have to be really careful about monitoring their, uh, blood chemistry. Uh, and the reason why is because, um, ketones will naturally bring down your blood pH. And if, that goes unchecked and unregulated, they can start to develop a, 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 a series of symptoms known as ketoacidosis, which can be pretty nasty on their health as well. Okay, let's get into a couple of common examples. Lecithin and cephalin. All right, lecithin is something that is found in um, brain and nerve tissues. Uh, it can also be found in a number of different, uh, um, depending upon its derived, uh, its origins. Um, lecithin can be used as a thinning agent um, in certain types of foods. Um, but where we find it generally, we're talking about egg yolk, wheat germ, yeast, this is what the structure looks like. So again, the blue box here, this is our glycerol backbone. And you can see we've got a three carbon chain. Each one of those chains has what used to be an alcohol group on it. But now instead of an alcohol group, we've got an ester for the top two chains and a phosphate group on the bottom chain. And again, we can tell the phosphate group there because, you know, we're dealing with a phosphorus center. Attached to lecithin, attached to that, po that phosphorus group, there you see choline. And so the net result of this is I've got an interesting molecule here where I've got a couple of fatty acid groups but I also have this group at the top that has a little bit of polarity to it. Because I've got phosphorus, which is somewhat electronegative, and I've got this charged component right there. So um, we'll get into this more in a little bit, but just kind of log that in your head. I've got some nonpolar stuff, and I've got some polar stuff, and they're both on the same molecule. It's going to have some interesting implications for us. All right, so that's lecithin. Um, cephalin, same idea, two fatty acid chains here. The only difference is that instead of choline on the phosphate group, we've got ethanolamine. That's really the only difference between the two. Otherwise, you know, the, the carbon chains here, those are 16 carbon chains. Those are uh, 
uh, palmitic acid derivatives. But yeah, choline makes it lecithin, ethanolamine makes it cephalin. Sphingomyelins, they're kind of unique. The, the sphingosine group here, we're showing it as kind of like a T-square shape, this uh, right angle here. So the molecule sphingosine is a little bit more complicated than just that three carbon glycerol group. So as a result of this complicated kind of structure that it has naturally on its own, it only can accommodate two chains. One of those changes, chains is the fatty acid. One of those changes is the phosphate uh, amino alcohol group. The other big difference here is because of the way that sphingosine is uh, constructed, this attachment between the sphingosine and the fatty acid, it's not gonna be an ester in this case. This is actually gonna be a nitrogen here. So instead of forming an ester, we're gonna end up forming an amide where I've got the carbonyl group in a nitrogen group instead of a carbonyl group and an oxygen group. That's another <clears throat> difference between these two. Otherwise, they look really, really similar. Now, where do we see these? We see these in myelin sheath, the white matter uh, that surrounds your nerve cells. This is what one of them looks like. So here I've got palmitic acid as my fatty acid. But notice here I've got an amide instead of an ester. And then again, here, this uh, sphingomyelin um, where we've got uh, choline, and palmitic acid um, coming together. And you can see also this, this chain here, this is not a fatty acid chain, it's different. And so this is what separates the sphingomyelins from the uh, glycerophospholipids. This extra chain here wasn't present on the glycerol. And that's what's going to make just two attachments instead of three. <clears throat> All right. Last bit for us here. And I don't know if we'll get through all of it, but we'll get through enough of it to make sense. Um, steroids. <clears throat> so looking at steroids, that was the other half of the lipids flow chart that we started with on Tuesday. So most of the stuff that we've talked about to this point have been the fatty acid version of lipids. This last little section, we're going to talk about steroids. Remember, steroids have that steroid nucleus in common. That's what makes them steroids. From a structural standpoint, what we're looking at is, again, three cyclohexanes attached to a cyclopentane. And they're all arranged kind of side to side 
with the exception of the second to the third. Second to the third is arranged to the northeast instead of just straight to the right. So a diagonal between ring two and ring three instead of going straight across. Of the steroids, cholesterol is probably the one that we are most familiar with and also probably the most important one. Cholesterol is the one that when you do blood work, um, lipid panel kinds of things, this is what they're usually looking for. From a total standpoint, generally speaking, they're looking for a number less than 200 if we're gonna consider your cholesterol values to be normal. Now, there's a little bit more nuance that goes into it than that. They'll also look at kind of your, your, um, low, your low versus your high, your LDL versus your HDL. But generally speaking, that total number is the first thing at least that they focus on. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from what you eat. But the actual formation of cholesterol generally is your liver. So your liver produces cholesterol. It has been linked to this idea that if you consume foods that are lower in cholesterol, lower in saturated fats, that seems to kind of cross over into your bloodstream. You tend to have lower values there as well. Where do we get it? Primarily from animal products. Meats, milk, eggs. Now, it is important to have cholesterol. You can't not have it. You can't completely cut it out of your diet for one because it's pretty much impossible to do so. And secondly, because your body does actually use it for something. It's used in the formation of your cell membranes. It's used to make brain tissue and nerve tissue. It's used to make your hormones, which are steroid based. And it also is um, important in the development of vitamin D, which your body can make um, naturally. Where things get a little bit complicated is that in elevated amounts in your bloodstream, it can actually begin to accumulate inside of your arteries. And so the two pictures here, the one on the top here shows what a normal open artery looks like from a cross-section standpoint. So if you were to take an artery, which is a tube, and cut it down the um, middle, you know, an open artery would look like this. That white space there, that's where the blood goes. That's where the blood flows through. Excess cholesterol can find its way into the arteries, clog up the arteries. You can see this bottom picture here has a lot less white space, which means that the blood is going to have a harder time pushing through it. And so that makes your heart work harder. That means that your blood pressure gets elevated because... You're having to exert more force to push that through your body. This is where your discussions of heart disease and, and other things come about. Other steroid issues in your body, bile salts. Bile salts are the results of liver synthesis of cholesterol. So you take that cholesterol, um, you um, process it, and those bile salts get stored in your gallbladder. Generally speaking, these are a good thing. This is how your body largely tries to flush out the cholesterol that exists in your body. Um, your gallbladder has basically nonpolar and polar regions in it. And basically it just beats up the cholesterol 
to a point where we can get it to dissolve in your blood and get flushed out um, in your water. Downside is that in excess amounts, the bile salts can accumulate and that's what forms what are called gallstones. Another important biomolecule inside of you are your lipoproteins. Um, lipoproteins are used to help move um, fats throughout your body. As we've already talked about, we know that fats are nonpolar. But most of your body is the opposite. It's polar. And your highway system in your body, your blood, is also water-based and polar. So how do we move these non-polar things throughout your body to get them to where, to get them from your stomach, where you ingested them and broke them down to the rest of your body? This is where lipoproteins come in. If we combine lipids, with um, glycerophospholipids and proteins, we can make them water soluble enough that they can be transported throughout the body. And we call this um, combination a lipoprotein. Happens through the formation of an ester bond onto that steroid nucleus. Um, and that ester bond, the presence of those oxygens, along with um, the introduction of some of those polar regions inside of your um, phospholipids are enough to create something polar enough that it can dissolve in water or at least uh, be soluble enough to be moved in your bloodstream. How it works is this. So the lipoproteins take advantage of, remember I told you to log that in your head. You've got these phospholipids here. The phospholipids, this polar surface, these are the phosphorus groups. That polar surface can surround the fat using the nonpolar fatty acid portion as the thing that connects to the fat and the steroid groups to allow them to interact with each other. Remember, like dissolves like. Polar and nonpolar don't mix, but polar and polar mix, nonpolar and nonpolar mix. Well, if I've got a molecule like a phospholipid, that has a polar and a nonpolar section on it, what happens is that the nonpolar tail, the two fatty acids, interact with the lipid, and that polar head group comes out on the outside. Well, if I interact enough of those all the way around the molecule, what I'll have is a completely encapsulated fat that had all non-polar stuff on the inside, and now it's the outside. It's all phosphorus. It's all the polar stuff. That can go in the water. And that's what happens. So the formation of these lipoproteins, this is what allows us to move water, excuse me, um, move fatty acid molecules, move nonpolar fats throughout the bloodstream to the various portions of the body where it's needed. And when it gets to where it's going, the lipoprotein disassembles 
and the fatty acid is able to go out to wherever it needs to go. Those lipoproteins make up what, uh, make up the other part of that lipid panel that you get when you do blood work, HDL versus LDL. High density lipoproteins versus low density lipoproteins. The high density stuff is good. The low density stuff is not so good. The difference between them, well, as the name implies, it's the density. Now, because of that density difference, it actually has different effects inside of your body. HDL, its primary job because of its density, it generally takes things from your body systems and transports them to your liver. Once in your liver, your liver can work on them, break them down, and help to flush them out through your gallbladder into your urine, push them out of your system. What makes low-density lipoproteins so dangerous, or at least more um, difficult, is instead of transporting from the body systems into the liver to be flushed out, it takes those from the liver to the other body systems. So if you have a higher percentage of LDL, it's going to result in more fat being stored up in your body because it's gonna transport that fat from where it gets used to other parts of your body. Whereas HDL, the good stuff, takes it from those body systems, puts it into your liver so that your liver can process it. <clears throat> All right, we've got just a couple of minutes. We also have just a couple of slides. Um, so we'll briefly talk about steroid hormones, which is the last piece of it, information here. Um, steroid ho hormones are your chemical messenger system in your body. They are derived from cholesterol, which is another reason why we need cholesterol in our diets. And they can form a variety of different kinds of compounds. These are what make up your sex hormones. Uh, so for men, that's your testosterone, your uh, androsterone. For women, this is what forms your estrogen and your progesterone. You can also find that these steroid hormones come from your adrenal glands as well. These are your corticosteroids, um, which can help regulate your electrolyte levels as well as your glucose levels. Structurally speaking, you know, all of them have the steroid center. The primary differences uh, in them are largely just simple ones. So what is the difference between testosterone and estrogen? Well, not a whole lot. You got an extra, you got a uh, benzene ring here as opposed to just a, a couple of double bonds. Uh, we've got an extra bond here when there wasn't one in the estrogen. The difference in sex hormones is not all that much. Um, but in terms of functionality, pretty considerable. And when you look at testosterone versus uh, progesterone, you can see there, not a whole lot of difference either. Which is why when you get into the um, synthetic steroid game. That's why a lot of those synthetic steroids, uh, especially, um, you know, if you're trying to amp up testosterone or um, amp up, uh, uh, you'll see progesterone used in a number of those supplements because there, there's a lot of similarity between it and testosterone. 
So anabolic steroids, these are largely derived from testosterone. Um, their use is controversial, uh, mainly because of the uh, idea of performance enhancers. They can also be quite dangerous um, because of some of the side effects associated with them. But again, they're all testosterone derivatives. Um, and again, if you compare them, any of them, to that first structure here, you'll see a lot of similarities and commonalities between them. Finally, the adrenal corticosteroids. Um, these are made in your adrenal glands, which are right on top of your kidneys. And the two primary ones we talk about, um, aldosterone, which is uh, what is used by your kidneys to electro to balance your electrolytes and your water levels, and cortisone, um, which um, simulates the uh, synthesis of glycogen in your liver. And so that's one of the key processes in regulating blood sugar and um, kind of uh, your blood glucose level. So that's all for this particular chapter. I know we kind of blurred through that last section a little bit. Um, not to worry, for the most part, um, the homework assignment that you have focuses primarily on those first two sections. Um, but what I want you to do, you know, take your time, go through the assignments this weekend. If anything pops up as being kind of unusual or weird, um, just send me a quick message, let me know, and bring all of your questions with you on Monday. Um, we'll kind of do a Q&A session before we get into the quiz, uh, just in case there's anything that kind of stopped us up or, or confused us. Thanks for giving me those extra couple of minutes. Have a good weekend.